Hello everyone. This is Miguel Dianes with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We are very happy to co-host this webinar about on bill financing for Iowa's communities. And I would like to welcome everyone uh, this afternoon and, and thank everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, so as I said, we're going to be talking about uh, about on-bill financing and how it can work for uh, municipal utilities across Iowa. And, and so before I start the webinar, I would like to ask everyone to please mute your phones if you're using the phone. And and so you, you can use star six to put your phone on mute. And uh, later on in the webinar, I, there will be a time to, uh, to for questions uh, after the two speakers that we have for the webinar. And so you, you can use the chat box to ask questions, or you can also raise your hand on the upper level, on the upper part of the webinar, and, and we, can, uh, we can unmute uh, if you're doing uh, through your computer. If, uh, later on, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can use You can use your if you're doing the phone and you want to ask a question, you, you can just uh, do it with uh, pound six to unmute your phone at that point. Uh, so, uh, as I said, my name is Miguel Yanez, and and we here at, at ESI in Washington D.C. we been doing uh, on bill financing uh, for the past five years, and we are very excited um, about this project and how to help communities develop this great resource uh, for energy improvements and for water improvements. So in this webinar, uh, we have two speakers from Eugene uh, Municipal Utility, the Eugene Water Electric Board in Oregon, and, and also from the city of Bloomfield in Iowa. Uh, but First, uh, let me hand uh, over to uh, Sarah Kaplan from the Iowa Municipal uh, Utilities Association, who has they've been very uh, gracious to co-host this uh, webinar with us. So, uh, so Sarah, uh, take it away. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, we have been looking for new ways that we can improve um, the energy efficiency services that we offer to you and ways that you can perhaps improve your programs to get better results as technology is developed and, uh, and changed. And this is one way that we think might be the wave of the future and might be beneficial for you in evaluating your energy efficiency programs and how to what are our next steps and how to move forward. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining us and um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, for, for those uh, great words. And, and th uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending this webinar. And now let me hand it over to I believe Misty uh, Fisher from Eugene Water and Electric Board, who will talk about their on bill financing program that they've been running uh, for the last uh, for the last uh, decade. Uh, Misty, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, actually, this is Mark Freeman. I wanted to introduce who we have on our end. We have Misty Fisher, who is our loan administrator. Um, and um, well, it's, it's, Misty Fisher is our loan administrator. It's administrator. Kathy Gray, who is wow, is this on auto feed the slides? 
There we go. We stopped it. So we have Misty Fisher, our uh, loan administrator, Kathy Gray, who is our residential program supervisor, Dan Morehouse, who is our commercial industrial um, supervisor, and then uh, I am the uh, manager of customer service and energy management services here at EWEB. And uh, we've been doing this for almost two decades for a pretty long time. Um, so hopefully what we have to share with you um, will be helpful. We're the largest municipal, municipal utility in the state of Oregon. Um, been around since 1911. We have about 89,000 customers, uh, 80 of which or so are residential. Uh, we have a five-person board, which compared to IOUs, I'm realizing just how wonderful a five-person electric board is versus a public utility commission. Um, and we started doing energy efficiency stuff in 1978, so we're, gosh, what, almost 40 years into this. So, um, <clears throat> so we'll give it to Kathy now. So, hi, this is Kathy Gray. Um, why would a utility want to loan money to its customers? Um, it, using public money is always risky, and uh, that question was one we had to answer before we could go forward. Fortunately for us, we had a uh, storm that worked in our uh, favor in that we had entered a contract with the Bonneville Power Administration to provide energy efficiency to our customers. Part of that contract included a financial penalty. And we were partway through that contract and realized we were not going to meet our financial obligation and we needed to do something to get our customers to take part in the efficiency programs. So we went out to our customers and we asked them, why? What's going on? And we learned from them they did not have the out-of-pocket money to pay for the costs of doing the work. We were incenting customers a certain percentage of the cost, but that little bit out-of-pocket they could not come up with. So what do you need to get started? Could you back up, Dan? Thank you. What do you need to get started? Uh, you really do need a pot of money. You need, you know, the support of your upper management and your board. Uh, you need to figure out what you're going to offer, what kind of requirements you're going to have, and, you know, what you're going to do on your security. EWEB started with a pilot of about $200,000. And using that pilot, we were able to prove to our board and to the executive management that loaning money to customers was a viable means for reaching our targets, our energy efficiency targets. After the pilot, we went forward with our loan program being available only to residential customers who had excellent credit with the utility, and the loan amount was up to 1,500, uh, zero interest, and paid over a term of one to three years. In 1995, we expanded that program beyond the, the original offering to residential customers into our business customers and to our investment residential property owners of multifamily buildings and rentals. Um, this is Misty Fisher, and I'm going to continue on with the slideshow. I am the loan administrator. Um, I've had the privilege of doing this for eWeb for about 11 years now, and I manage the process um, for loans from the beginning of the loan application um, received from our customers through loan funding and including any loan issues once it's into our billing system. And right now, um, for residential, all residential loans are zero interest loans. Um, they have a term between four to five years. Um, we lend up to $20,000 to each customer. Um, however, that is broken down into different um, 
programs that we have, such as uh, window offerings have a max amount of 4,000. Our ductless heat pumps have a max amount of 4,000. So the 20,000 is an aggregate amount of, which could include multiple loans to one person. And um, our business loans right now um, are interest bearing. They're at 4%. Um, there's no fixed cap for that. Um, and that has also a four to five year payback term as well generally. Um, the requirements or how I process my loans, um, obviously first I look at the application. I make sure all the information is um, there that I need. Um, the first step is I confirm ownership through RLID, which is our Lane County Deeds and Records um, website. Um, the owner has to be the applicant. Um, it can't be the renter. Um, and that's because if I do file a lien on the property, um, I have to lend to the owner of property. Um, the other thing I look at, of course, is their eWeb payment history. Um, I'm looking to see that they pay us on a regular basis, that they pay their account on a monthly basis to zero. Um, I typically first look at the first 12 months history. Um, I do go back farther than that if I see a pattern of non-payment or some type of delinquency, I'll go back farther. Um, but for the most part, I look at the, first, um, the last 12 months. Um, and then what I do is I go into TransUnion and I pull a credit report and I review their personal credit information. Um, obvious things such as um, are they current on their mortgage, do they have collections, are they paying their um, credit card bills on time. And I take the information from both their eWeb payment history and their TransUnion credit report and I um, put that or plot that on a credit matrix that I use. Um, the credit matrix um, it helps me determine um, whether or not an approval um, can be applied to the customer also for what dollar amount. Um, because based on credit worthiness, there could be adjustments based on how much we'll lend um, or the term that we'll lend it. So that's all determined and worked out through the credit matrix process. Um, based on the outcome of that, um, I will determine whether or not the loan will be um, have a lien placed on it or whether it will be unsecured. Um, if their credit worthiness isn't um, quite up to par, um, the choices that we have is I file either a UCC 1A lien through Lane County Deeds and Records um, or a memorandum of agreement. Um, both place a lien on their title. Um, and then the other options I have if I need additional security is I give them an option of auto pay on their eWeb account or a reoccurring credit card. Um, and that might be used um, in the case specifically when a customer has issues with their payment plan back to eWeb and an auto pay might help them um, get better credit with us and keep them on track and improve their credit score through um, eWeb's credit history. So once I process the loan applications um, and it gets time to fund the loan, um, I send out loan contracts to each of our customers. Um, they send them back to me. I then enter the loan into our CIS billing system. Um, I do that on a batch process. I do it every Monday. Um, we fund the checks on the same week. Um, it's a very uh, efficient, quick process. Um, people can make prepayments. That's allowed. Um, they cannot make partial payments. Um, that works great in our favor because it doesn't allow a customer to become delinquent on just their loan or just their electric and water charges. Um, so what that means is if their bill is 100 bucks and they send in 50 bucks, they can't say, I want the 50 bucks to go to the loan, or they can't say, I want the 50 bucks to go just to electric. The 50 bucks is spread evenly open all open items. Um, and that um, has worked in our favor, specifically when there's a loan um, on their eWeb account. And once the loan is in the billing system, um, I follow it through any customer issues that might happen, um, including um, payment arrangements if they need them, um, account issues that come up, um, or any delinquency that might happen. So the next slide shows an example of one of our bills. And you can see under additional services, um, that's where the loan monthly loan charge shows. Um, so it's a separate loan, it's a separate item charge on their bill so it's clear for them to see which part is the loan versus their, their electric or water charges. And again, you can see on page two under additional services, it shows the heat pump loan and what the charge is. So the security, just a little bit more specifically, um, again, it is dependent upon how it comes across on the credit matrix. However, um, it allows me to place a lien on um, the person's personal property um, and how that helps us 
um, in, in later in the loan life is that if someone is delinquent and I have a lien on their property, if for some reason there's a foreclosure or a short sale or something happens with that property, my lien stays on the property until it's paid in full, whether that be via the customer or the new buyer or the bank or wh whoever ends up paying it. Um, and so those liens are a really good mechanism of security for us. Um, again, the auto bank draft, it just helps customers who might be having some payment issues become current and actually improves their credit rating for eWeb. And LLCs and partnerships that apply, I also um, prepare a personal guarantee that they sign along with their paperwork. So right now, um, what we currently offer through EMS, and this does change, our programs change with time um, and different trends. And right now, our residential is offering insulations, windows, ductless heat pumps, and ducted heat pumps. And on the commercial side, it's um, they're kind of they're custom projects, and it's just out-of-pocket expenses for a custom project that goes through the commercial department. Um, and again, time those have changed. We've had other programs such as solar or HVAC or air sealing, um, and time and trends will change what our offerings are. So this slide, just very briefly, is um, can show you um, the number of residential projects that went through, um, how many of those projects had a loan, and then the total um, monies loaned out for that year. Um, so for example, in 2002, you can see um, that there were a little bit over 2,500 projects done, um, and it looks like about 40% of those took out loans, 40 to 45% of those took out loans. Um, and also in that year um, that the money lent out was a little over uh, $3 million. Um, so that's just an example of what's that, what that is showing. And, and then commercial, same thing, the number of projects we did, the number of loans taken out, and then the money, um, the monies that were lent out to the EWIP customers. So the cost of the program internally for us, what we consider is um, the labor for loan administration. So you know, all the items I touch or any other staff touch um, in preparing loans, uh, the recording fees through Lane County for filing my liens, um, and then the credit checks that I do for all the applicants. And then, uh, so the estimated cost, just the general number, would be about 100000 a year. Um, about four years ago, we started charging a $50 loan administration fee to our customers. Um, the only customers we don't don't charge that to our ones that are qualified limited income at the time that they apply. Um, but all other customers get a $50 loan origination. And if they go through the program multiple times, they have the multiple charge. So um, if they come through the program at one time and they do multiple, that's a charge for each different program. And you know, despite the fact that our credit matrix is pretty liberal in the sense that um, because we have the power of power, because they have a power bill with us, um, we can be a little more lenient in um, the customers that apply um, in regards to, say, their personal credit. Um, our default rate has been under a half a percent, so that's not 50 percent, that's under half a percent um, since the inception of our loan program. It's always remained really low. And again, that's because we have the power of power. People have to have electricity. So. Um, and again, just a brief note that partial payments of bills are um, spread across all open items on a bill. So that, again, also doesn't allow someone just to choose to pay their electric or water. They monies would also be um, applied towards their loan in that case. So this slide um, I included because although there are lots of great reasons and things, that, um, including in our loan program, there, there are some issues that come up. Um, so realistically wanted to bring those to your attention. Some of the things that I deal with um, on a daily basis with the loan program um, are refinance limitations. So we notify our customers about six different ways in the upfront application process that if they go through a refinance during the time that they have a balance on their loan with eWeb, that their loan needs to be paid in full. And the reason that is is because if I file a lien on the property, anytime you do a title transaction, you have to have a clear title. So we put up front in as many ways as we possibly can to our customers that if they go through a refinance or any title transaction, during the time they have a loan with us, it is due and payable. Their loan to us would be 
to and payable. It does create problems. Um, people sometimes don't remember that that's in their contract and they don't remember seeing that in the upfront paper. Um, so they can, it can cause them problems um, through their refinance process. The other thing that we don't do um, for our loans is we will not subordinate our loans. Um, and again, uh, customers that are going through a title transaction, uh, it can cause them issues in, in that process because we do not subordinate. Um, move out customer, um, it's put in their contract that when they move out or sell the house that the loan becomes due and payable. Um, again, it comes up when customers just didn't realize that or, or didn't read maybe their contract fully and they didn't realize that that was in there. Um, and so I deal with those, um, that issue with some customers. Um, there's also red flag implications simply just because the credit application has um, a lot of personal information including name, address, social security number, things like that. Um, so there are some processes in place to reduce, um, you know, any implications with red flag that might come up. And then um, the other one just being um, personal, interpersonal issues that customers come across um, in their own lives such as divorce or separation um, that might happen when they have an eWeb loan on their eWeb account and say one calls to disconnect or one's staying and one's going. So those personal issues um, come up also with people that have loans. So although again, the overall picture is it's a great program that we offer to our customers, there are some things that you have to consider um, that will you know, come up like this with customers. So we started off doing loans with our energy efficiency programs. The loans have become a very effective tool for eWeb in many ways. Um, and customers appreciate it because it is on their bill, it's not a separate uh, item or they don't have to deal with a credit union or a second party in this uh, process. So what we've done is we've expanded it. Um, we live on the Mackenzie River, we provide water and electric and the Mackenzie is the source of our drinking water as well as three hydro generation plants. And so we have a bunch of septic tanks on that river that were uh, challenging for us or we're leaking so we provided loans so customers who own those septic just could have the money to repair them so in turn they would not be leaking into our water source. Um, water leaks is just in general. There's a lot of customers out there who you know they find out on their bill that they used way more thought and, and the uh, cost of fixing those water leaks was beyond their means um, so we uh, helped them finance that. We used to have steam heat in our downtown area and we decided that we were no longer going to provide that, but that provided a big problem for a lot of our customers to pay to transition to either put in their own gas boiler or transition to an alternate heat. So you see that was a pretty sizable amount, about 3.3 million. And business growth and retention, we specifically don't call it economic development because we feel that most of our growth can be better served by helping our existing customers customers uh, grow and expand, not that we're adverse to new businesses, these loans would be available to them. But this allows people to uh, uh, basically spread out the cost of the, uh, the upfront cost of doing business with us with, with all these system development charges, pipes, wires, trans, uh, transformers, allows them to uh, spread that over five years uh, as opposed to paying it all up front. Human resources repay. Again, we do loans for pretty much anything these days and that is somebody we pay to relocate when we offer them a job they, prior to um, the period needed to not have to pay that back and so this is a loan to help them pay back the moving expenses you would pay to get them here. And we just recently started a loan program to, to uh, help our commercial customers um, with the cost of installing uh, EV chargers. Uh, um, so a way we can help promote that and hopefully expand the amount of charges in our service territory. Okay, so we feel like it's been pretty successful. We've done you know well over 11,000 loans since we started. Uh, loaned you know 47 plus million dollars. Uh, as you can see, the vast majority of that, from a percentage-wise, goes to residential customers. But dollar-wise, it would be probably a different split than that, um, especially when you look at the 3.3 million we did for our STEAM customers. That was all commercial. And the amazing thing is the default rate is 0.5%. I mean, our default rate overall for our utility is very low as well. Um, but we have had in 2014 and year-to-date in 
2015, we haven't had any defaults. Um, so during the recession, you know, that, that kind of spiked a little bit, um, but there wasn't anything that made us rethink our process or want to do less of this. It's a, it's a go-to tool for us, not only for our energy efficiency, but as you can see from the previous slides, um, was to uh, help our customers do business with us. So there you go. There's the happy all four of us. And uh, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Open for questions. Great. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you also, Misty and, and Kathy from uh, Eugene Water Electric Board there in Oregon for detailing and, and, and going through all the details of your on uh, financing program, not just for residential, but also for commercial and all the other loans that you provide. And, and I think we, we should uh, we should go to uh, to our next speaker, uh, Chris Ball of the city of Bloomfield. In Iowa, and, and then after after quiz, we'll we'll have a, uh, a few uh, moments uh, for questions. And so, if you, if everyone can hold the questions for after uh, Chris goes through his presentation, uh, so so Chris, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Uh, I, we've been uh, looking at unbuilt financing for about six months and talked to many, many people. Um, and every time we speak to someone else, we learn more. So I want to say thank you to the folks in Eugene. That was some great information. And um, I picked up a few things that I hadn't learned yet. So thanks a lot. As Miguel mentioned, I'm from uh, the city of Bloomfield. I'm the energy efficiency director. It's a new position. I've been in place for about five months. Um, so one of the questions is, and, and Eugene addressed this, why does um, why would a city begin to loan money at all? So I think it's important, you know, we get caught up in our day-to-day -day jobs. We, we um, and, and it can be difficult to start new programs, especially if it's significantly different than things we've been doing in the past. So I think it's good to step back and remember and state the obvious why do governments and municipal utilities to exist exist? And primary reason is to serve our, our citizens, members, and customers. So I, I just want to set that as the frame for, framework for where we're going. Um, Bloomfield is a little different our, in terms of our structure. We are, um, we are a municipal utility, and that municipal utility is housed under the Director of Public Works. It's not a separate entity from the city. Uh, the city and the director of public works reports to the city council as do the city clerk and myself, the energy efficiency director. Um, it, it may seem a little odd to separate the energy efficiency director from the utility chain of command, but I think it kind of sets things up so that there's a healthy amount of checks and balances in place. And you know, sometimes uh, the energy efficiency director might propose ideas that can seem in direct conflict the regular operations of the utility, but uh, I think the council's decision to separate the two departments creates a structure where ideas can be challenged and scrutinized just a bit, and then that scrutiny helps make the new project stronger. Um, earlier this year, the city council decided to pursue energy independence with regards to electricity. Uh, essentially, that means that we will be a net zero community by 2030. It doesn't mean that all of the electricity will be produced by renewable generation. Um, we, we have generators on site, and we may choose to operate those generators here, gas and diesel. But I think it's also worth noting that Bloomfield is using the term energy independent as opposed to net zero. Uh, simply put, energy independence it does a better job of speaking to the values of our community than the term net zero does. And so one of the first steps to look at is energy efficiency, because simply it, it costs less to use less energy than to produce it, right? So 
Um, last year, the Iowa Association of Municipal Utilities uh, did a study on Bloomfield to see if we could be energy independent. And according to that study, we could reduce our electricity consumption by about 23% if we pursued aggressive inefficiency actions. Um, I, I should mention there's a lot of very good information in that study, and we don't have time to go into all of it during this webinar, but it is available on IAMU's website and uh, for the executive summary. And if you'd like a more detailed version, feel free to call or send an email, and I'll be happy to send it out to you. So installing energy efficiency measures at homes can, I mean, they cost, it costs money. Bloomfield's not a wealthy community. We have uh, it's about 2,600 people, 1,200 residences. Um, over half of our households are lo have low to moderate incomes. And frankly, traditional sources of simply may not be available for energy efficiency types of expenses. But I, I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, limited access to capital isn't confined to those of lower income. According to a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, almost half of all Americans are un unable to come up with $2,000 in cash within 30 days without selling or pawning possessions. You know, while those in lower income brackets were less likely to have access to cash, um, it wasn't limited to lower, house lower income households. It crosses social and economic boundaries. Uh, put bluntly, Americans aren't known for their saving habits. And when cash emergencies arise, they can put real stress on households. Um, I don't know, perhaps some of you have experienced and come through economic hardship. And you might remember how much easier the rest of your life can become once those problems are solved. I mean, you might remember how much more productive and creative you, you became once you knew that your family's basic necessities were covered. And so that's part of our goal uh, when we're in a community where there is a lot of economic stress, if we can help relieve some of that stress, not only do we address our energy issues, but we also think we're going to free up people's bodies and minds to do much more for our community. <clears throat> so last night, the Bloomfield City Council decided to fund an on-bill financing pilot project. And uh, i got to tell you, I was sweating because I wasn't really sure what I was going to say today if the, if the project wasn't funded, but thankfully I don't have to figure that out. So the pilot project will be funded at $150,000, and it's our hope that we can complete 10 to 15 projects with the initial funding. Now I want to pause here for just a moment and talk again about that access to capital. Last night after the city council meeting, one of the members in the audience came up to me and he said, how do I participate? Um, I, my furnace broke down last spring. It's going to cost me $2,800 to, to replace it. I can come up with $2,000. I don't know where I'm going to come up with the other $800. And this isn't a person that's, um, what, that most would consider to be low to moderate income, pays his bills, gets, gets things done as a respectable member of the community, but he's still has that economic stress, and he's trying to figure out how to solve it for his family. So what are we trying to accomplish with our pilot project? Well, first of all, we, we need to clarify our business process. As opposed to Oregon, uh, this is a brand new thing for us. And so we have to figure out how, we're gonna, how do we take the applications, how do we process them, how do we put it into our billing system, how do we track all of the information. Um, what level of monitoring of the installations are we going to do? Uh, you know, are we going to work with vendors and contractors? So, so just from a very business process point of view, we've got some things to work out. We've got the, we've established the policies and procedures, but this is a chance for us to do a real world test and work out the bugs before expanding the project. But we also hope to do you know measures to changes in energy consumption. Um, we hope to generate some buzz in the community and, and then decide whether or not we want to look at expanding the project. So our, uh, our details, we're, we're looking at about a $15,000 maximum loan. There is no application fee, 
but once the loan has been approved, there will be an, a $100 origination fee to cover our administrative expenses, including labor in the office and filing liens at the courthouse. Um, we looked at uh, a 0% loan, but it was um, much more attractive to the council if we had at least a 2% interest so that we weren't losing money on, the, on this process. Our goal is to aim for uh, bill neutrality. In other words, we hope that we can structure the loan so that savings realized through these energy efficiency measures will offset the loan payment. Um, and we're looking at loan lengths between five and 10 years. We haven't done the math on them yet to figure out what it's gonna take for the individual. But we, we will look at each loan individually to decide what seems to work for the quickest payback and try to get as close to bill neutrality as we can. Um, we've got a number of measures that we're proposing to cover with the initial financing. Um, as you can see here, furnaces, air conditioners, appliances, water heaters, uh, lighting. Uh, even though it's not a, a big expense at the household level, uh, it can have a big impact. So we want to make sure that if they're going through and doing other things, let's go ahead and get some lighting taken care of as well. Our applicants, we, you know, we are opting not to do credit checks, formal credit checks. Instead, uh, we're just going to rely on our in-house uh, accounts. If, they've, if we haven't notified them that we're turning off their utilities within the past 12 months, then uh, they'll be qualified for the loan. Uh, as long as it's an owner-occupied residential facility. Um, we spoke to several other utilities, and, and as the Oregon shared, the uh, default rate is extremely low, and we want to be as liberal with our ability to assist people as we can be. So our process um, during the pilot program is we're going to identify the potential applicants who will best support the pilot program goal. And we're still trying to figure out what that means. Do If we're trying to find those people that are uh, kind of seen as leaders in the community but maybe need some help on their homes, or do we look at those houses that are the most energy inefficient right now? We have done an analysis of the entire community and identified homes that we believe are uh, energy hogs. But we haven't figured that all out just yet. Uh, we are going to go during the pilot phase and do a pre-application energy audit and make recommendations to the homeowner. Um, then we'll want the, app the applicant to get estimates, bring those estimates back as part of the application process. Uh, once we've approved the application, we, we have some data loggers that are going to measure temperature in the home, plus we'll look at their utility usage. We want to see if you know, sometimes you implement a measure, an energy efficiency measure, or do some weather sealing, and now because the home is more efficient, maybe the temperature changes, and so you don't see necessarily a reduction in energy usage because instead of keeping the temperature at uh, 65 in the winter, they keep it at 75 because it's more comfortable and now they can afford it. So we want to be able to track both energy usage and internal temperature. Um, after they install the measures, we're also going to do a post-installation post energy audit so we can see, you know, just try to track what was the difference between the before and after. And then hopefully once we collected this information, we'll analyze it and decide what that means for the future of the program. One of the things that we've heard from some of the utilities that we've worked with to develop this program is that um, you can get some untrustworthy contractors or vendors. So one of our goals is we don't want to select which contractors or vendors a household will use, but we are going to publish a directory. Anyone can qualify to be in that directory as long as they fill out uh, the application for the listing. And I guess it's our hope that maybe there will be some self-filtering that some of those people that um, don't go to the effort to get the to get the proper licenses or get the you know to get the proper training. Maybe they won't go to the effort to fill out the application to get listed in the directory. Again, the directory isn't a an endorsement by the city. It's simply a, a listing of those that have applied to be listed within the directory. 
And after the program, uh, after the pilot program, you know, we're our, it's our goal to secure some outside funding to expand the program. We've been working with um, uh, EESI in order to try to find some additional funding, and uh, I hope that with that, well, this uh, pilot project will establish our process in a way that we can demonstrate how we can that then we know how to run the program here to secure the additional funding. Um, I, I do want to point out uh, we have had a lot of help with this project. Uh, EESI has provided a lot of technical assistance. They've brought resources to us from around the country to help us while we're developing our pilot project program. Um, within the state of Iowa, we also spoke with Cedar Falls Utilities and the city of Woodbine. Both of those communities have run under the financing programs in the past. Um, so uh, I would reach out to any of these three organizations, and, and obviously the, the folks from Oregon could be a help as well. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, a few people here. Um, as I mentioned, EESI has given us a lot of support, as has um, the Iowa Economic Development Authority, IAMU, uh, Cedar Falls Utilities, and the City of Woodbine. All of them have put together great materials for us and pointed us in the right direction. And uh, Warren Halverson is a, uh, one of our local DISTA members that is serving in Bloomfield to work on um, building energy efficiency capacity within the in the community and we, we wouldn't have that opportunity without funding from AmeriCorps. So that wraps it up for me. Um, I'd be happy to stay online and take questions and uh, you can also feel free to contact me by phone or email if you have things that we don't cover today. Thank you. This is Miguel Yans again and I would like to thank Chris very much for talking about his program in this webinar and providing all the details of the pilot. And I would like to congratulate him for getting his city, for getting the city council of Bloomfield just yesterday to approve the umbrella financing program. It's very exciting that Bloomfield is going to start this pilot and, and that hopefully it will become a, a larger program uh, getting a, a large percentage of, of the homes in, in Bloomfield uh, retrofitted with energy efficiency uh, measures. Uh, so again, th thank, thank you for both uh, speakers, uh, Eugene and Bloomfield, for uh, presenting in this webinar and providing your uh, lessons learned and experiences uh, throughout uh, your program. And so now I would like to uh, open uh, this remaining time for anyone who may have questions uh, for both uh, the speakers that have presented. And, and so just to remind everyone that if you're using our, our computer, uh, you're muted by default. And so if you can, uh, you can post uh, a question as, as, a com uh, as a comment on, on the box on the lower right hand side um, and alternatively you can also raise your hand uh, which is an icon on the upper part uh, of the screen and then uh, we will uh, unmute uh, your your speaker if you're doing through the computer and then you can ask a question if you are listening to the webinar through your phone uh, you can uh, use the, uh, the pad 6 uh, to unmute your phone if you want to ask any questions Uh, Miguel, this is Chris Ball, and I, I'd like to ask the folks in Oregon a question, if I may. Okay. Fire away. Um, so I, I'm interested in learning. I, I, all right, my understanding in Iowa is that we can't um, disconnect for non-payment of the loan. 
uh, it, the two utilities that I've spoken to, it hasn't really been a major issue anyway. But I am wondering if if you run up into issues, the the requirement that they any payment is spread among the utility payments and the loan could solve that issue for us. And so um, I, I wondered how you how you would, how you found out or the language. I'm interested in the language that you use to get that done. I guess. So perhaps you could share that with me by email or? Yeah, this is Misty. I'd be happy to um, share that via email. Um, just on a general statement, um, it, it does, because payments are spread, um, it does greatly reduce um, any situation where we may have to disconnect. However, um, because the homeowner has to apply, um, they could have, um, if the homeowner sells the house, or let's see, let me, let me back up here a little bit. Um, because an owner may not live in the house, that's a situation where um, if the loan payment became default, um, we could disconnect. Um, I've been here almost 11 years, and I think I've put out a disconnect maybe three times, three or four, under five times um, for a situation like that. Um, typically, because people need to have power, um, they simply can't get to a disconnect situation, um, and, you know, and including with a loan on their bill, it helps us. Um, it does happen uh, very rarely um, where we've had to disconnect or at least put out um, a letter of disconnect for that. Um, but you are right in the sense that when you spread um, any payments over all open items, that it greatly reduces um, that situation from coming up. And we do have language in our contract um, that covers that. Um, and again, I can share that with you via email, um, but it is written within their contract that um, that we bill monthly, they pay monthly. And so they do put themselves in default of their contract if they get behind on their eWeb bill and they have a loan um, charge on there. Okay. Thank you. That was a great question, Chris. Anyone has any other questions that may want to ask? Um, yeah, hi, this is Stephanie Enlow with the Center for Rural Affairs. Um, Chris, you said that right now the program is only available to owner-occupants. Do you have any plans to um, extend the program in the future to be available to renters? And then what would need to happen to make that um, viable for your utility? Sure, um, and I think uh, there is interest from the city council to look at renters. We know that rental units are, um, in some cases, some of our least energy efficient homes. So I, I think it is something that we'd look at. It's just that we wanted to be sure that we could uh, really study things well in this pilot. And, and so we, we just chose not to go that route. But uh, And then I think, additionally, it depends on where our funding comes from, too. Uh, to expand the program if we do it internally or if we, you know, have access to external sources of funds, what their requirements will be. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Stephanie and Chris. Any other questions? This hey, Miguel, this is Mark at eWeb. Uh, we, we failed to put our contact information at the bottom of our screen. Um, so hopefully you have that or um, that you could share with folks. But for in general, we're willing to share anything that we have, including like our, our matrix on determining credit worthiness. And so everybody saw our names, so it's really pretty easy. First name dot last name at eweb.org, and those are our, our email addresses. Happy to answer any questions after the webinar is over. Uh, great, uh, that um, Mark, that that's a great uh, way to to point that um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in our website ESI. Dot org, and we will also send the link and the presentations to uh, Sarah Kaplan. So 
if she wants to post it on, on her own website or would like to send them to uh, the uh, members of the Iowa uh, Municipal Duty Association, she, uh, she can do that. And also, uh, the slides will also be posted, and any ad additional information will be posted in our website. That's EESI.org. Um, I see that Jeff wants to ask a question. You, um, you can either type it or, uh, or speak in your mic if you have one on your, on your computer. So uh, Jess, uh, Jess' question is, uh, did Eugene quit loaning money for renewable energy projects, and if so, why? Are you specifically talking solar? Because I assume that's part of it. Um, we typing. We have a green power program, um, a voluntary green power participation program um, that offers incentives. Well, through the people who fund it, they've chosen where they, it's a voluntary um, process for our customers. They create the um, pool of money, which creates an incentive base um, for the solar program. So yes, we no longer loan for the solar. We only do incentives, and we also do um, some pretty sizable grants, like $50,000 grants for solar on an annual basis. But you're correct, no loans, uh, just incentives or grants for solar projects. Also, we do, this is Kathy, we do an evaluation on all of our programs and determine the cost effectiveness of those programs. And so uh, the solar, in, in the case of solar water heating, has kind of fallen out of our resource planning purview. Uh, it's not cost effective for us for forward with those projects at point in time. So also, this is Miguel. Uh, Jeff Gertz um, also has a question for Eugene. He asks, what energy efficiency measures do you loan for most often, and which measures have had the best impact for the money? Well, we've been doing this, this is Kathy again, for quite a long time. And in the beginning, it was your insulation, your envelope measures for houses that had the greatest impact. And now what we're seeing that has the greatest impact are the, the heating systems, the heat pumps, the ductless heat pumps in, in homes. And so, um, I would say that's what we're seeing the majority of our loans in those areas, and at this point in time, that's where we're getting our greatest savings. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kathy, for providing those answers, and also for Jeff to ask those questions. And and so if anyone has any other questions for the speakers, uh, this is the time to ask them. Uh, again, you can also uh, send some questions later on if you have some un uh, questions to the speakers webinar. But this is a great time to do them. So, Jeff Gertz also asked, uh, how does Eugene identify contractors and verify quality of installation? Just like Chris mentioned in his presentation, we have a directory of contractors that is made available to our customers 
those contractors apply to be on that list. They show proof of insurance, license, bonding, and all of that. So that provides some surety to our customers. We do not endorse any one contractor. Now that is in the residential area. In the business arena, the commercial area, the contractors, we do not have a directory of contractors per se. The business operators select the contractors that they typically work with. Um, we have uh, what we call verifications. We go out and look at the installations. We're also um, participating in the Bonneville Power Administration's weather, uh, weatherization, energy efficiency programs. And through that, they provide some third-party verification. So they will take a percentage of the work that we have completed and actually send somebody else, a third party, out there to look at that work to assure that that work is being done to the specifications and standards. Great. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, for your uh, answer, and thank you, Jeff, for this great question. So we still have a couple of minutes more for, for a few more questions. If anyone has any uh, questions that they may want to ask the presenters and speakers. Uh, well, it looks like Jeff has one more. Uh, he's asking if we, if you provide or support training for contractors. Well, we like to consider our contractors the professionals. However, we do provide support and training. So if uh, there's a new technology that is coming into our marketplace, we will bring in the manufacturers, the distributors uh, to come and talk about those products. Uh, we also um, have a contractor's website, which we post information for the contractors. We post, like, if we change forms or if there are other links to places that would provide them information. Uh, there is also regionally in the Northwest um, some projects where they actually do certify contractors to do certain types of work, like installing ductless heat pumps. Uh, is one in particular that they certify the contractors. They certify the contractors for duct sealing for in the ducted heat pump uh, arena and commissioning. So there are uh, pro programs out there to help support the contractors. We have in the past even purchased uh, software for our contractors to use when they were be beginning to do the um, analysis of the heating zone so that they could do the balance charts and, and it would comport with what we would be looking at. Wonderful. Th thank you again, Kathy and Jeff, for those questions and answers. So just uh, about to finish this webinar, we, we still have uh, one or two minutes for additional questions if anyone has them. Great. So, uh, so it's it's already uh, time uh, at the end of the webinar. So I, I would like to thank everyone who has attended this webinar and participated and asked questions and also what would like to thank very much uh, for the presenters uh, at uh, Eugene uh, Water Electric Board, uh, Mark Freeman, Misty Fisher, and Kathy Gray, and Dan Morehouse for explaining and detailing their uh, own biofinancing program in Eugene. And also would like to thank very much uh, Chris Ball at City of Bloomfield Utilities for Explaining and talking about uh, his uh, on bill financing uh, pilot that has just been approved by the city council. I would like to congratulate him again. And so, thank, uh, thank you everyone for attending. And, and it would, uh, I'd like to see you, everyone, in uh, another webinar that would uh, like to see how City of Bloomfield 
goes with its fire program. So thank you very much again, and thank you for uh, Sarah Kaplan and the Iowa Municipal Association Utilities. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.